Greetings, welcome to The Dividing Line. It is, uh, it's a beautiful evening here somewhere outside of Columbus, Ohio, I think. I know I'm in Ohio uh, because, <clears throat> well, when I drove across the border, a couple things happened. First of all, I remembered back to the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, <laughs> which... Many of you in the audience can't remember that. Um, and I remember that Ohio was our bad luck state. Uh, each summer we would drive from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to Kinsley, Kansas to be with, uh, to visit my grandmother. And my dad uh, would help her with all sorts of stuff um you know work on her little house that she had and and stuff like that and if we were going to have a problem because we were dirt poor and if we were going to have a problem um it was going to be in ohio a car problem and that's where it always was so we considered ohio our bad luck state so i was thinking about that as uh, as i crossed the border the other thing that i noticed <laughs> i'm i'm almost tempted to call the ohio uh road department highway department i don't know what they call it uh here in ohio uh just to say thank you <laughs> just to say thank you because i'm sorry uh but i was stunned to discover that the i-70 uh which back in the days when i was driving as a kid was a pretty nice road isn't much of a nice road anymore and um especially in indiana and illinois it's almost as bad as the I-40 in New Mexico, which is a cow path, okay? I mean, wow. New Mexico is, wow. Third world country as far as roads are concerned. Um, and Illinois was pretty much the same <clears throat> as far as I-70. I mean, just potholes and you feel it a whole lot more when you're 44 feet long, okay? Uh, and getting onto the bridges and off the bridges just throwing you all over the place and beating you up like anything as soon as i cross the border into ohio smooth roads all the way really impressive i was i was very impressed and then i got here to this campground I've not been to this campground i'm starting to visit some campgrounds multiple times getting to know the people and you know how to get in and out and and that's sort of nice to know so i pull into this one it's a very treed um, you know, there's lots of big trees, not little trees. You know, sometimes you can tell when they've been planting them. These have been here a while. These are big, big, big trees. And um, it's beautiful and it's cool. It's 69 degrees right now, which is really, really nice, um, but not raining or anything like that. And uh, I walk into the registration registry place. So the KOA, they, they have these little stores. And some are really, really little and some are rather extens extensive. All depends. Well, it was like driving in. It's like I found where time froze um, in 1969, <laughs> maybe 1968. Everything that they were selling was tie-dyed, as you can see from the shirt that I bought. Um, tie-dyed T-shirts and sweatshirts. And they even had some really nice, um, like, ladies' uh, pajama bottom type things, really uh, loose fitting and, and really super soft, you know, and stuff like that. And they were tie-dyed. And I even said to the lady, I said, um, you know, I, I, I should, I was thinking about maybe getting, you know, this for my wife. And then I th said, that would be really stupid. <laughs> and I mentioned that uh, to my wife and she said, yeah, good call. <laughs> Wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. Um, so anyway, uh, it's it's a nice little spot we're at here. I have a huge day on the road tomorrow, over eight hours driving. That's I don't know how I did that. Sometimes I get on the road, and then I figure out where I'm stopping. It's like, how did I do that? I don't, I don't know. Uh, it'll be a big one, uh, really tiring. Uh, but that'll be the last stop because from there, I'm just driving the truck. Um, um, in fact, very thankful that we've arranged with one of our supporters one of our friends to work with them to get me in and out of the uh area where the g3 conference is because uh <laughs> the hotel 
<laughs> the hotel we're staying at, it does have a, a small parking facility. And the clearance for the parking facility, six feet, two inches. Six feet, two inches. In other words, if you drive a Mini Cooper, you you and then you can walk bent over, um, you can you can park there. But if you've got like a man's truck like I do, um, yeah, no, uh, that that ain't that ain't happening. Um, so uh, one last little comment before we get into the good stuff for the program today. I I lay down, took a brief nap this afternoon once I got here. <clears throat> And I get up and someone has pulled into the spot next to me. And I'm not sure if you should feel embarrassed. Um, like the ladies, you know, when two ladies show up and they're both wearing the same dress. Um, but I look over, I'm looking over at them right now uh, at the slot next to me here. And it's a black pickup truck. I've got a black pickup truck. It's not the same make, but black pickup truck. And a the, the identical unit that i have i mean down to the model number it's the exact same <laughs> unit parked right next to me so we're twinsies um but we don't know each other uh, i may have to at some point uh jump up and run over and close the window on that side uh because they just had visitors show up and i have a feeling they're going to be like doing a cookout and stuff like that you know within five feet of um, the window so uh we may take an uh, a, a commercial break or just go okay hold on a second and uh and i close the window so that <clears throat> we we don't have that interruption but anyway all right before we talk about a lot of stuff that's going on in uh in the world today i i wanted i was thinking about uh, when i was in st charles a friend of mine was asked asked me a question about the phrase the son of man now, he had asked me this a few weeks ago and i he had said, this is how I've always understood son of man. And, and he then mentioned that, you know, that that's a, a reference to the, the humanity of Christ versus the son of God, which is in reference to the deity of Christ. And I'm like, um, no, nah, it's a lot more complicated than that, actually. And um, somebody else addressed, you know, sent him to some longer expositions on the subject. But it reminded me of the fact that you can have really smart people that can believe some really dumb things. Um, Bart Ehrman is a smart guy. Everybody knows he's a smart guy. Um, but Bart Ehrman is one of those people that says that the that we we he, he believes that the Son of Man in Jesus' teaching is a eschatological figure, and that it's not Jesus. And I remember the first time I encountered that idea um, that that there was that this was a third person reference, and and Jesus does refer to the Son of Man in the third person, um, but the the idea that he wasn't identifying himself as the Son of Man is so obvious in uh, Mark chapter fourteen. You, you will see the Son of Man. And he quotes from, from Psalm 110 and Daniel 7, which is about the Son of Man, and applies it to himself. And a high priest tears his robe and says, you've heard the blasphemy with your own mouth. And so it's obvious. And if Jesus wasn't talking about the Son of Man, he would go, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, that, that, you, you missed it, guys. That's, I'm not talking about myself. He doesn't do that. And... Um, so I couldn't help, but I was just looking through the scriptures and I was thinking about what happened after the um, transfiguration. And, you know, I mean, what an incredible thing that is. I mean, transfiguration, what a, you can do, there's so much to discuss there. Um, wow. Here comes one of those, I mean, it's it's a full Greyhound bus size pulling a Jeep right into, not quite next to me, but quite close. I, I don't even know, I, I, obviously I don't have to worry about the fact that 
he's he's running diesel, not gas. So he doesn't have to pull into the places I have to pull into. But getting that thing around without running into things, I I don't even don't even know how you do that. But man, that's gotta be the loudest one I've ever heard too. Most of them are pretty nice and quiet. That one is ridiculous loud. Uh, so I hope he turns it off very soon because I'm having to yell uh, to get over him or I'm gonna have to go out there and close the close the door, one of the two. Um, anyway, these are live programs. That's, uh, that's the way it goes. Um, Rich, let me know if I'm still understandable. And if not, I'll just take a brief break and close the door so that uh, we can uh, continue on. It'd be nice if you could turn that thing off. Um, anyway, so, uh, I was looking at Mark chapter nine, the, the transfiguration and the story that is told there. And we've, we've done some discussion about that. You know, what does Moses and Elijah represent and, and, and things like that? It's fine. Okay, good. Uh, this is amazing microphone. I mean, I can barely hear myself thinking that thing is so loud. And if you can still hear me over that really ultimately annoying, massive thing, um, that's astonishing. I, I can't believe it. But anyway, in the transfiguration, who's Moses and Elijah, what they represent? And, you know, they both were translated and, and uh, you know, law and prophets. And there's all the other stuff that you can look at in the transfiguration. But then in Mark 9.9, 9, and as they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to recount to anyone, thank you, what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. So this is part of the what's called the messianic secret. Um, the, the fact that you know Jesus understands that there are important things that the apostles are going to see and hear um, during the ministry that are going to take on really special meaning um, only in light of the crucifixion and resurrection. And so he gave them orders not to recount to anyone what they had seen until the son of man rose from the dead. Isn't that pretty obvious who that's referring to? Uh, yes. And they seized upon that statement, arguing with one another what rising from the dead meant, not who the son of man was. They knew who he was talking about. What does it mean that he would rise from the dead? Because in their mind, the Messiah could not die. Not recognizing the differing roles the Messiah would take and his first coming and his second coming. And they began asking him, saying, why is it the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And so, you see, there was a very um, uh, strong tradition amongst the Jews at this time regarding the nature of the Messiah, the ministry of the Messiah. And there were there was a lot of speculation, uh, uh, understanding of what, what the ordering of things would be. And they had the prophecy there in Malachi uh, about Elijah. And so they, you know, they're asking, well, well, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And that also might be um, one of the objections that they were hearing to the idea that Jesus was the Messiah was, well, Elijah hasn't come. Now, notice what Jesus' response is. And he said to them, Elijah does first come and restore all things. Yet how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. And so... Jesus' response, interestingly enough, is uh, focused upon the scriptures. Um, notice, and yet, how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say Elijah has indeed to come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. So, a couple things. First, um, obviously, in Mark's accounting of Jesus' words, Jesus is identifying himself as the Son of Man. He is predicting the Son of Man's um, crucifixion, resurrection, rising from the dead. Um, and he is well aware of the 
what we would what we would in a, in an essence call the eschatology of the day um and the ordering of things in, in as the scribes and pharisees or whoever else understood uh, the coming of the messiah the roles of the messiah and things like that but in the midst of that um and the importance of jesus as the son of man the vital importance at the end of the gospel of mark and this this one this one of the things like whenever you hear anybody saying mark has a low christology <laughs> um you're talking to somebody who has a low understanding of mark anybody who says mark has a low christology has a very low understanding themselves of the gospel of mark that you may not want to say it to them in that way but that's that's the reality um because you you get to mark chapter 14 and just as in john there's a crescendo the crescendo in mark uh is found in the trial and jesus's conflation of psalm 110 with daniel 7 that's that's his confession that that is in mark what thomas's confession is in john you know my lord and my god here is jesus taking two of the most uh pregnant uh messianic exaltation texts and applying them to himself which you can imagine scribes and pharisees looking at this beaten man and you you take the most exalted texts about who he is craziness uh but that's what that's what you got so you you have all of that but then in the midst of all of that um you have this and i honestly think we sort of we we sort of skip over this or, or maybe it's because we are really accustomed to reading all of it. if you grew up in the church you've heard this over and over again but there is so much in the gospels that reflects for us and, and teaches us what jesus's view of the scriptures was and therefore for any follower of christ it should be rather simple for us to go if he rose from the dead his view of scripture needs to be my view of scripture scriptures cannot be broken they are god speaking um etc cetera, etc cetera. um just just needs to be sort of uh, reflexive on our part to do that and uh so uh but how is it written of the son of man uh, just as it is written of him the prophetic witness to jesus as messiah to his nature as the son of man to his work as being crucified and and rising again and the accompanying um prophetic aspects it's in mark it's in luke it's in john it's in matthew it's everywhere uh you you cannot even begin to to um and, and so it it strikes me um it really strikes me that uh, and i i didn't pop these up uh, but uh, brandon roberts the homosexual quote unquote minister um you know we've we've talked about him a number of times before his his launching into apostasy over the past couple of years uh if you go back in the archives this program you'll see six seven years ago um i did a review of some of the things that he was saying at that time and th this is not some prophetic thing um but from the start because at first he tried to be orthodox he, he he pretended orthodoxy he confessed orthodoxy um i don't know what it was about it but from the start i said give this guy five years and he's going to be so far out in outer space it's not even funny 
and it's been six or seven years but and he's so far out in space it's not even funny um there's no no question about it but he um this week said something along the lines of racism is sin jesus was a racist but he repented um and you know he just he says this, these wild 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 things you know that on every single cardinal doctrine that he has collapsed and he has to because if scripture is what it says it is if it is consistent with itself then he knows it condemns his lifestyle his orientation he knows that and so you have to fundamentally um in 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 the most basic ways deny the consistency of scripture and if you don't have a consistent scripture what theology do you have he also said this week that uh penal substitutionary atonement was one of the greatest uh what how do you put it perversions of the christian faith or something along those lines um and so, you know, he's gone off to Trinity College in Dublin to get a PhD in apostasy. Um, I think it's just give it to him right now. Uh, but he's gone there to learn more about how to pervert scripture. That's, you know, I'm really honored to have visited Trinity and to have debated at Trinity, but sadly, um, they'll do that. <laughs> so there's some things that we shouldn't really bother um, being overly uh, excited about it, about Trinity College and things like that it doesn't mean there aren't good people there but there's a lot of uh, a lot of bad stuff anyway so i just want to mention that you know as you're reading uh the new testament reading the gospels especially pay so say pay such close attention um we're gonna be doing a debate here pretty soon between myself and dr peter van cleek jr and um i've mentioned the the fact that he and his father have written three books that they've put out over just the past two years. Well, really, year and a half, um, but less than two years. And uh, they're coming from a reform perspective. Um, part of the argumentation is to try to use reformed epistemology um, as a foundation for a king, basically, well, Van Cleek just directly says he's he's an advocate that the King James version should be the standard English version of of all English speaking people. And of course, the TR is a subset of the arguments for that, but that is his perspective. So he is really King James only in that sense. Um, but coming at it from an interesting perspective, and um, that so much of so much of what was said in the first book i've read their books now um i mean this debate was only set up like two weeks ago it was right before i left maybe less than two weeks nothing but um so i had never heard of them before sorry i um but now i've taken the time to to read the three volume series and the book i mentioned last time um about poking the bear which uh van cleek jr put together which is a um i have to be careful here it's um it's an attack upon the practice of textual criticism it is based upon a level of hyper skepticism that's just astonishing it is exactly what i predicted tr onlyism must eventually do um tr onlyism must attack the study of the manuscripts the study all of that because from their perspective the tr really doesn't come from that even though historically you don't have a tr without erasmus doing textual critical study um the tr is a reconstructed text and for them a reconstructed text is an apostate text it's, it's not truly the word of god so on, in, on on one level they literally have to say that the tr has 
existed from the beginning. And yet historically, it's utterly unquestionable that the great Christological controversies were decided without the TR. The TR did not exist. It did not exist as a body of literature in the early church. That is a fact. That is an absolute fact. Uh, there are readings in the TR that are now defended as being providentially preserved by Jeff Riddle and by uh, Van Cleek um, that did not exist in the first millennium of the church anywhere. They have no evidence of their existence anywhere. And the idea that that text was in use by Athanasius or by Basil or uh, Hillary or whoever um, is so easily refuted. A anybody with uh, anybody, any seminary student, any Bible college student can demonstrate this isn't the case. It's easy. Even using something with as, as limited a range of textual variants as the United Bible Society's fifth edition, fourth edition, whatever you've got. I was, man, when I was in third edition corrected, I think is what we had when I, when I was in Bible college. But um, the citations in the UBS are um, limited, but they're fuller. They only give you the, the variants that are going to impact a Bible translation. They're, it's primarily designed for people who are doing Bible translation in other, la in other languages. But they give you a lot more information about each variant and especially about the early fathers. And so all you've got to do is uh, take Athanasius, uh, take uh, Basil, take uh, Hillary, and um, just go to some of the unique readings in the TR or minority readings in the TR. Um, or even majority readings in the TR, and they will be noted and find how many times that Hillary Athanasius gives a different reading. They're, they're reading a different text than the Texas Receptus. It's easy to do. It's really, really easy to do. Um, so what I'm going to need to do for about 30 seconds is uh, my dear neighbors have fired up a cooker right outside my window. <laughs> My windows are open. So uh, uh, before my smoke alarm goes off in my, my unit here, we are going to take a, just go grab a soda. <clears throat> I don't know why you turned it off. I mean, who cares? Um, yes, uh, another big, huge. Now, this one isn't quite as big a deal. Just pull it next to me, but it's quiet. It's nice and quiet. That is a guy's, I think I need some engine work. That's just all there is to it. But yeah, they're so, you can see they're pulling, their, they're pulling their vehicle behind them. I'm really not sure how that works. I get it. You know, I just do it opposite. My vehicle pulls this. <laughs> so there's, you know, that's two engines to maintain and everything else. Um, but yeah, those, those, I've, I've said it. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it one more time. As I look around here, even right now, uh, you know, I can see two units right here, much smaller than mine, much, much smaller than mine, tiny. Uh, you couldn't stand up in them. And then you've got these beasties. So I'm in the 35 to 40 percentile. So if, if you've got small, medium, and large, I'm in the lower end of the medium size. That's, I, I, I've been to enough parks now. I'm getting, when I get back on, Lord willing, I, I finish this trip off without destroying this thing. Uh, I'll have pulled over 20,000 miles since we got it. 
And so I've got a fair amount of experience now in these places in looking around. And yeah, I'd say we're between 35 and 40% percent percentile somewhere, maybe a little bit lower than that. Anyway, that's, that's where we are. So yeah, this is the time when everybody's pulling in and, and, uh, this would be the time if you were, if you wanted to do, uh, mobile home RV park evangelism, you set up a table out there with a telescope and some tracks and a telescope would not do <laughs> anything in this park. It is heavily wooded. Uh, you can't see anything, unfortunately, but in many places you could, you could do that. It'd be a lot of fun. Okay. What were, world were we talking about? I'm sorry. I just saw the smoke heading my direction. <laughs> I didn't want the fire alarm going off. Hey, road trip deal, man. Road trip deal. Uh, we just have to be thankful that they've got decent Wi-Fi. Well, actually, it's it's um uh, we're on uh, cell, but they've got good cellular coverage here, and so here we are. So we get to keep doing this type of stuff. Anyhow, all right, where were we? Um, we were talking about the upcoming debate uh, with Dr. Van Cleek and the fact that um, I have predicted. For a long time, that the that really the only consistent way for the TR only guys to to do what they do um, is to simply establish their text and to attack the practice of textual criticism, even though their own text has its own history and it is a recovered text. It is a reconstructed text, and Erasmus engaged in textual criticism. And so it's it's an incoherent system. But like I said, this book uh, really demonstrates that, you know, from their perspective, um, everything that has happened since 1644 or so has been irrelevant. It's just been irrelevant. All the papyri, all the major finds have no meaning whatsoever um, as far as the uh, actual text in the New Testament is concerned. Um, but what I was, what got me onto all that was that, you know, Dr. Van Cleek says all sorts of things I completely agree with. Um, where we disagree is not that the scriptures have been providentially preserved. In fact, I even heard, I was listening, I, I got a ride in this afternoon inside. My bike is five and a half feet that way. Um, I listened to an interview that Dr. Riddle did with Dr. Van Cleek, and Dr. Riddle talked about people who oppose the providential preservation of the text. It's not a matter of opposing the providential preservation of the text. It's opposing an ahistorical, incoherent, circular um, definition of what has been preserved um, over against a historically demonstratable uh, uh, way of understanding what has been preserved. So I'm looking forward to the debate. It, it will be, it'll be interesting. Um, Dr. Van Cleek, uh, did his PhD at Liberty, uh, but he also went to uh, Westminster. And so it'll be a, it'll be an interesting evening. It'll be very useful. It is what it's also interesting is that Dr. Van Cleek, um, claims to be an apologist. Now, I've not seen any of his apologetic work, um, but it is right there that, to me, there's where the issue is. You, you can't take his position um, into the debate format with unbelievers uh, because it, it, it requires you to embrace certain presuppositions, and we're not talking about presuppositions as in you were created by God. Um, if you're dealing with people who have another authoritative text, I just don't see how that TR only position can can survive. But anyways, we will see. And I'm thankful to Chris Arnson for um, putting putting this uh, together. And uh, I'll be perfectly honest. I didn't, don't even know which day next week it is, um, but. I'll figure out when I get there. Right now, I need to get to G3 and do the G3 thing and 
once that's done, then I can start thinking about that. And then once the debate's done, then I've got the zoom zoom drive back to Conway, Arkansas, and we've got the church history class. I'm really looking forward to that. I mean, the students are great and the fellowship is great. And um, so I'm going to be pretty blasted by the time I get home, but uh, it will have been a, a great experience. It's really, really great. Okay. Uh, let me get to my things here. Uh, did, did you see the uh, video? Matt Walsh was on with um, that guy. One of the popular guys. I've forgotten his name. Uh, MacArthur's been on with him and lots of people have been on with him. Um, ben Shapiro. And Shapiro asked about the differences between Catholics and Protestants in regards to salvation. And I was once again reminded that uh, there are such things as common grace or such things as there is such thing as natural law. That doesn't mean that it is it exists separately from God's revelation of what its meaning is, but it it exists because we live in God's world and we're made in God's image. Therefore, there is natural law. God has written his truth upon our consciences in the way that we have been made. And so someone like Matt Walsh, who is a Roman Catholic, um, can make natural law arguments. And, uh, you know, when you're dealing with something as wildly absurd, wildly absurd as transgenderism and the denial that we can even know what a woman is, doesn't take all that much effort uh to demonstrate the absurdity of these things but that doesn't mean that you have a regenerate mind and that doesn't mean you understand spiritual things and a lot of people get confused about that um they see a roman catholic saying true things and you don't recognize um the difference between saying there are Mormons who say true things. There are Jehovah's Witnesses. There are Muslims who say true things because we live in God's world. People confuse that with having an accurate understanding of the fact that the fundamental reality that steals true peace from Roman Catholics is that they don't have a finished work of Christ and therefore they conflate justification and sanctification so they can never have true peace and never have true peace if they're trusting in their own catholic gospel um like i said i hope and pray that there is a large number of roman catholics that aren't trusting in the Roman catholic gospel um but um if you saw that matt walsh thing it sort of yeah caught my caught my attention along those lines uh, also since I was in Illinois, uh, I was reminded of what's going to happen January 1st. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to want to drive through Illinois um, after January 1st of 2023, uh, because if you are up to date, you know that the left in Illinois the communist socialist party sometimes called the democrats um has uh, passed a law that basically it does away with with money bonds uh, with bail and the list of things where you will now be arrested charged told to appear for trial and then simply let go without any bond includes second degree murder almost every form of robbery and theft and property damage and assault and basically if you don't kill somebody you're gonna be arrested and let go now right now we're seeing exactly the crime rates 
in Chicago, Los Angeles, Portland, Seattle are through the roof. And the reason for that is criminals now know nothing's going to happen. To them. Nothing's going between George Soros utterly corrupting our uh, legal system by using his money to put traitors in the positions as attorney uh, attorney generals and 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 the people in charge of enforcing the law and bringing charges. He's used his money to buy traders to put into these positions. And so it's self-evident that if you are a law-abiding citizen, you're not a criminal. You're not a danger to the people around you. And yet if someone breaks into your home and you defend yourself, you're the one that'll end up in prison, not the criminal. The guy, the guy breaking in may already have murdered three people and has been let go. Um, the the man that that killed uh the jogger uh, a couple of weeks ago the mom the t the teacher uh who had served uh, had been given a 20 year prison sentence for rape and kidnapping before um same type of situation except there's not even they're not even to bother the prison sentence part these people will just simply be let loose on the population and this is what you do when you want to destroy a nation and that's that's what they're doing. They're they're destroying the nation. They are completely overthrowing law. And I'll just be honest with you, we're going to have to do some discussion about this pretty soon. But it's interesting to me that many many people who only a few years ago, now there's still all sorts of folks who even mention theonomy and they just they lose their minds and they, they will never be corrected. They cannot be corrected. They know what theonomy is. And if you don't believe that, then, you know, they, they think they can define it. Okay, I, I can't deal with those folks. Believe what you want to believe, whatever. But there are just a lot of my fellow believers who are starting to realize, you know, if we leave law to civil cultures to just come up with, if, if we actually don't believe that, that God has spoken with clarity as to what is true, what is honest, what's just, um, we're left in a real mess, especially when the world becomes secular. I mean, these people are going to say, these people are literally going to make laws that are going to say that we have to celebrate transgenderism or uh, that we have to support um, um, same-sex mirage and, um, and and denigrate what is good and true and honest and just and in our own families and and with our children and our grandchildren. And man, that's a that's a real mess when you leave it up to man to define law. Yeah. And a lot of Christians are going, man, I wish we had something we could give in its place. And it's like, well, we do. And I just, you know, I've said before, the first time I ever heard about theonomy, I was in seminary and um, basically, you know, Westminster Seminary was saying bad, bad, bad. And so, okay, bad, bad, bad. And if they said, well, theonomists believe that you're justified by keeping the law and theonomists believe that, that little children that. should be, you know, um, uh, you know, beaten to death at the city gate and you know, all this kind of stuff, then it was sort of like, well, OK, it must be. But of course, that's not what it was about to begin with. And now that we are living, see, back then you could get away with the myth of neutrality. You could. The, the 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 state at least here in the united states wasn't coming after us yet now we realize you know what the state needs to be under the we need to be able to say the state you're going to be judged and that means we need to have a standard by which to say that huh and that's causing a lot of people real 
issues and problems um because that sounds like that theonomy thing and it is that's really all we're talking about when we talk about theonomy is that god's law um uh, was never meant to save uh, it was never meant to justify um it, it, it can never do any of those things but it does <laughs> The promise of the new covenant is I'll write my law upon their hearts. Well, what law was that? What what law could that even refer to? And what we're talking about is the fact that God has revealed what true justice is. And man, we need to be able to tell people what true justice is. But the vast majority of evangelicals can't even comment. Because, well, we can only talk about that spiritually. <laughs> we can only... We can only do that in reference to the church uh, or the Noahic covenant, and there's nothing about that in the Noahic covenant. So we can't really comment on uh, transgenderism or anything like that because we just don't have anything to say. Okay. Um, so in the midst of all this, we have this uh, push to codify Obergefell. So pass a law codifying what's in a Burgerfell so Burgerfell can't can't be overturned. You know, Clarence Thomas might not have wanted to say the things he said. He was right, and it's, he, was, he was speaking the truth, but the left went insane because of it. And what was it, 47 Republicans voted for this thing in the House, and it could pass in the Senate, too. Uh, there may be enough Republicans, because it's very obvious. I mean, just look at um what's the guy's name i i don't again this isn't part of what i wrote down to talk about um but the fellow up in moscow at new st andrews did a review of peterson's interview of this guy on the right well supposed to be on the right you know the gay guy who they got their designer babies uh whatever the guy's name was uh you can tell how big I am on looking at that kind of stuff. And um, so, uh, by the way, and, and I think I mentioned this on Twitter, I was a little slow to get to this, but you want to listen to that. You want to listen to that review of the Peterson interview with that guy on quote unquote gay parenting. It was devastatingly good. It was clear. It was insightful. It, it cut to the heart of things. And, uh, so I'm slow in saying, yeah, take the time to listen to it. But it it did a wonderful, wonderful job. I highly recommend it to you. Track it down. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not a Republican. I'm certainly not a Democrat because I'm not a communist um, or a socialist uh, or any of those other things. Uh, the Repo Republicans are not conservative enough for me. Um, haven't been since the 90s. Uh, I left the Republican Party. Because, you know, when I was like 18, I I just missed, just missed voting for Reagan the first time. Um, but uh, I left the Republican Party because they were already giving money to pro-choice pro candidates. And I, I wasn't going to support that. And I, I couldn't do that. And so I'm one of the dreaded independents. Um, and... When I look at what's going on today, you know, I look for the people who have recognized the importance of worldview and that there are there is a massive divide between the anti-human destructive secularism that, of course, is the religion of the left, but is likewise the default position of most people on the quote unquote right. And so if you've got 47 Republicans that can vote uh, for the profaning of marriage, they don't have a meaningful worldview. They have the same worldview as the left. It's just in slow motion. It just doesn't want to go as fast. And they're not going to conserve anything. They're not going to be willing to fight for anything. And so that, that's, just, that's just the reality of what's going on you you look at any any republican senator 
in the United States Senate right now that would vote to uh, codify Obergefell. The, these people are not our friends and you're, you're not gonna be able to look to them to save us from anything. So it would be, yeah, fascinating um, if you could actually get these people to speak uh, directly. Uh, I just happened to glance down, this is sitting on my screen, and I don't think, yeah, I haven't refreshed my Twitter screen. So capturing Christianity, and you'll notice he just loves throwing out all these little tweets about, you know, I'm looking at the Marian dogmas, and it's, oh, come on, guy, get serious, get serious. And here's one from an hour ago, and so probably about two hours ago then. Christianity would be a lot easier to refute if it entailed fundamentalism. I don't even know what that means. Um, if you mean fundamentalism as in some type of closed-minded, King James only, I'm going to preach 10 sermons in a row on why wearing dress pants, uh, pantsuits will send women to hell. I've heard those sermons when I was a kid, so I know it's it's out there. Uh, fine, but there's a historic meaning of fundamentalism, and fundamentalism was about fundamental doctrines. And outside of some of the eschatological stuff, they did include in the fundamentals. It's like, you know, virgin birth, resurrection, creation, the Bible is word of God, stuff like that. So, you know, there are a few people that can do the one sentence really pithy stuff, but most people just face plant when they when they do that <laughs> instead. So there you go. Um, just a couple more things here that I was noticing today. I wonder, I don't know if you saw the, uh, the tweet. I retweeted a graphic of it because of course I'm blocked by Matthew Barrett at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, but there were, number of pictures, uh, one including, uh, you know, um, the Aquinas's Summa Theologica, and then there were pictures of Roman Catholic authors on the thought of Thomas and stuff like that. And I just kept remembering some of my Reformed Baptist friends only a few months ago, saying, yes, that has nothing to do with Thomas. It's just, they're overblowing that. And, and now just follow Credo Magazine and Matthew Barrett, and it's all about Thomas. It is all about Thomas. And I just wonder, you know, Midwestern, isn't that, you know, Spurgeon College? You know, isn't there a bunch of stuff? In fact, I, I looked at their Twitter feed and, you know, they've got this saying where you, you can get together and people read uh, Spurgeon sermons and that's great. You don't see somewhat of a contradiction uh, in emphasis between um, Spurgeon and Aquinas. I just wonder how many people who have donated to Midwestern and donated to the, you know, the Spurgeon stuff and things like that. I wonder how many of them are aware of the fact that uh, Matthew Barrett has taken that program and the emphasis now is not exegesis, it's philosophical theology. It's uh, let's give people, um, uh, scholarships for writing papers like Thomas Aquinas would have written. I, I wonder how many are aware of that. Uh, is that really uh, an appropriate uh, direction for a Southern Baptist seminary? I wonder. I'm not a Southern Baptist, so I can't say, but I know a lot of Southern Baptists that uh, listen to the program and doesn't seem like it's... Uh, uh, the, uh, there's a real contradiction there. There is there is a fundamental contradiction there, and um, so so there you go. Um, one last thing, I guess. Looks like I have just enough time to do this. We'll cover everything and touched on everything. Um, Stephen Knowles um, tweeted. You can't actively deny the Nicene Creed and be said to worship the true God. Okay. 
I agree that's true. But my concern is that we understand why it is true. I believe it's true, but we need to know why it is true. Because if you simply make the statement and you don't explain the foundation, then it's really just an argument of authority. Um, just believe this. But why is it true? And this is this is central and key to everything we're facing today. Central and key. Um, the Nicene creedal statement, not the Kansas decrees of the Nicene Council. And that's, <laughs> some of us make that appropriate distinction and many people don't even know it's a distinction that needs to be made. Um, it, it is ironic to me that many of the people who are so um, up in arms these days couldn't tell you what the sixth canon of the Council of Nicaea was, their life depended on, or why it's relevant. But anyway, um, why is the Nicene symbol or Nicene theology, the fact the sun is fully God, not derivatively, not only representationally, but as to his being eternally God. Why is that true? It is not true because Nicaea said it was true, because it was true before Nicaea, right? We can point to Ignatius in 107 and 108 AD, giving us just as high a Christology as Nicaea. Just as high. Letter to the Ephesians, he gave you a Christology of Christ that is equal to Chalcedon. He did. Look it up yourself. Um, hypostatic union, two natures, everything right there. Long before Nicaea came along. So Nicaea did not make something true. The truth of the Nicene Creed has always been found in its fidelity to the scriptures as the word of God. That is the only reason it's true. That's not why it's true for a Roman Catholic. And it just seems that a lot of my friends watched the debates that I did with Jerry Mattatix and Patrick Madrid and uh, and Robertson Jenis and Mitch Paqua and all these people over the years. And they watched and they, ooh, yay, but didn't seem to really enter into what was being said. Because that's what I was saying all along. And what Rome was saying, what they were saying, is the Nicene Creed is true because the church says it's true. It has an authority because it is an ecumenical council. And once you subject scripture and no longer have solo scripture, re reject scripture's um, self-authentication and subjugate it to external authority for verification, that is the church, um, then those councils become expressions of the unwritten tradition of the church. And hence, with the magisterium, you produce dogma. And in all the debates, even when we weren't debating Sola Scriptura, that was still the foundational issue. If we're debating the mass, they would say, hey, what we teach about this has that same authority. Now, of course, it comes from councils way down the line, and we will go, well, we don't accept those, but we need to be consistent, don't we? Because if we say, oh, we accept the intrinsic authority of Nicaea, but we don't accept the intrinsic authority of the Fourth Lateran Council, on what basis? Because if there is an, extrin an intrinsic 
dogmatic authority in councils after scripture, where do you draw the line? And who gave you the authority to do it? I just don't think a lot of my brothers have thought all that through. And they're doing the knee-jerk reaction thing. And so when I hear people saying, oh, I heard James White doesn't believe the council might see it as authoritative. That's just a bunch of baloney. I, I can't believe how easily people are deceived and, and believe lies. What Nicaea said was true because what Colossians 2.9 says is true. And so for people to say, well, you're rejecting the authority of the council of Nicaea because I say Nicaea's authority is secondary to scripture and is dependent upon its consistency with scripture, then you've never really thought through where your ultimate source of authority lies. You've just never thought it through. Some of us have had to do this for years. And we're just sort of like, well, we'll just keep doing it, even though we're getting canceled by our own people for doing what we've been doing all along, and they just didn't understand what was happening before. So there you go. There you go. All right. Well, we I, I actually, believe it or not, I think I, yep, yep. I had actually put a little list, talk about this, 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 and I got through all of it. That'll also make it easier to write up the blog article, <laughs> as long as I don't close the file without saving it. Uh, which I've done more than once. Um, so uh, this weekend, uh, hopefully be seeing a lot of you at, um, boy, I just noticed this picture. It's really dark outside now. Yeah, that is one nice thing about being out in the boonies and sun goes down, you're amongst a bunch of trees, it gets really nice and dark. Um, so it's just this one light, the light behind my camera. Uh, so it's sort of like a spotlight type thing now. Um, Anyway, uh, we'll be at G3 this weekend. Looking forward to meeting everybody that's going to be there. Going to be talking about the scriptures and all sorts of stuff like that. Lots of Q&A and, and uh, look forward to meeting with people and talking with folks and stuff like that. And uh, then uh, Chris Arnson's uh, pastor's luncheon uh, the week after and uh, the debate, more discussion on scripture. And then uh, looking forward to all the students at Grace Bible Theological Seminary, early church history getting to talk about all this stuff. We will never get it all done. I, if I get anywhere, if, if I even make it through Augustine, I'll be stunned. I, I should go. I have to go, Pat. I have to go. We've got to get through Calcedon. Got to get through Augustine. I'm not sure. But there's so much even after that. Yeah. Anyways, that's the problem with intensive classes. And I don't live in Conway. So that's sort of how it, how it goes. But um, really looking forward to all of that. Thanks for listening to the program. Hope it is... Uh, as always, I hope it causes you to think things through um, and maybe gives you an hour to where you're not having your IQ sucked down lower by Twitter. <laughs> um, raise, raise the level of consideration um, a little bit. So uh, please pray for me as I travel uh, tomorrow. Um, oh, there, I just saw Dave Rubin. Yes, sorry about that. That was 14 minutes ago, but I, I don't know, I looked I looked on my phone and didn't see it, but I still don't see it. How weird is that? Okay. Anyways, yes, it was Dave Rubin and his partner and their designer babies. And um, the uh, review from the professor, I believe he's a professor of New St. Andrews. Some of the best stuff you'll listen to. Uh, need to track it down. Need to listen to it. Trust me, if you enjoy this program, you'll, like, you'll love it. Anyways, thanks for watching the program this evening. Pray for my travel tomorrow. Eight hours in the truck can be uh, can be tiring, and uh, you still need to be awake at the end when I get where I'm going. And uh, so uh, appreciate your prayers for that. We'll see you next time on the dividing line.